All right, let's get started. Uh, so first off, uh, thank you all for coming this evening uh, to our Center for Sustainability Development event. Uh, so just first off, this event is uh, sponsored by the Center for Sustainable Development, which provides students with the opportunities and resources to engage in our community sustainably. We can define uh, sustainability as the integration of social, economic, and environmental systems. And addressing issues with these three pillars of sustainability equips students with uh, sustainability literacy, which gives them the knowledge to tackle 21st century issues. Tonight's talk, which focuses on speculative climate fictions, highlights the critically important nature of using an interdisciplinary approach to sustainability. And it fits well within this year's CFC Sustains Solves theme of sustainable cities and communities. Uh, Conrad Scott holds a PhD and is an instructor in the University of Alberta's Department of English and Film Studies on Tree Six Métis Lands. He researches contemporary science fiction and environmental literature, and his current project examines the interconnections between place culture and literature in a study of environment and dystopia in contemporary North American fiction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Scott. Thank you. Can you see me and hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Hello and welcome from the University of Alberta near the North Saskatchewan River in Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place and traveling route to the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene and Nakoda Sioux peoples. It is with gratitude as a visitor here that I acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. I'm Dr. Conrad Scott and today in my talk, City Futurisms, Climate, Environment and the Imminent Near Future, I want to consider the importance of thinking forward in time about the places and urbanized or sometimes not environments in which we propose to live. I will also consider how we propose to live, touching upon the with what and also with whom. I will talk about real world concerns and projections, of course, but I will also focus on what recent science fiction and or speculative fiction imagines for our near future. We need the imagination encapsulated by a mode such as fiction, which enables society at a larger scale than that of the scientific to see and hopefully understand problems before it's too late or at least to consider them from a more invested standpoint. The questions of where and how we imagine we will continue to live are especially pressing in this time of rapidly increasing climate change and other environmental shifts. For instance, those of you living in Charleston right now, of course, might find this particularly concerning since the elevation of the College of Charleston is only about 11.23 feet above sea level, according to the United States Geological Survey's governmental spot elevation tool. Why is that potentially an issue? In Mark Bould's very recent The Anthropocene Unconscious, which was uh, launched in November, he notes that climate change is not going to happen it's already happening and deep down our culture knows it. But though 99% of peer reviewed scientific articles are now in consensus that humans are responsible for climate change, as prominent thinkers like Timothy Morton and Jody Dean explore, climate change feels quite abstract as a concept. Morton calls climate change a hyper object and comments elsewhere that quote, the fact of the Anthropocene makes it impossible even for the most recalcitrant metaphysician of presence to get a grip on ecological reality. Dean astutely calls this problematic phenomenon anamorphic, which she says means that, quote, the Anthropocene is a matter of perspective. We can't look at climate change directly. She indicates that the crux of our current crisis is in how we are unable to fully apprehend its materiality as its complex processes fundamentally change how we were able to perceive and experience the world. Dean also puts this more succinctly in terms of climate change effects. Relying on multiple disparate measurements, she says, we look for patterns and estimate probabilities. We see in parts, 
the melting ice caps, glaciers and permafrost, the advancing deserts and diminishing coral reefs, the disappearing coastlines and the migrating species. Evidence becomes a matter of extremes as extremes themselves become the evidence for an encroaching a catastrophe that has already happened. The highest recorded temperatures, the hockey stick of predicted warming, sea level rise and extinction. Once we see it, the it of climate change encapsulated into a data point or disaster Im disastrous image, it's already too late, end quote. This anamorphic experience even comes down to how we hear of what seem like only minuscule rises in sea levels. For example, with the US National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration reporting that quote, sea level continues to rise at a rate of about one eighth of an inch per year. And indicating that on future pathways with the highest greenhouse gas emissions, sea level rise could be as high as 8.2 feet or 2.5 meters above 2000 levels by 2100. But not only is this rising occurring at an increasing rate, the potential scale of how much it can rise is gargantuan. Given the numbers I just referenced, while some currently residing at the elevation of around 11 feet, uh, might imagine themselves unaffected by sea level rise in the immediate future. It is also true that if all of the ice in the polar caps, as well as places like Greenland, were to melt, then global oceans would rise much higher than 11 feet. They would soar to approximately 230 feet, flooding every coastal city on the planet. This last point, of course, feels dire and overly dramatized. Will the eastern seaboard of the United States be underwater in 20 years, in 40? by the start of the next century? The answer is very probably not to the extent where all polar ice has contributed to global sea level rise. Though other phenomena such as king, storm, and so-called hundred year tides, as well as the thermal expansion of seawater will continue to increasingly affect coastal low elevation areas in more extreme ways. Climate change exacerbated sea level rise is already acting in more subtle and insidious ways than massively flooding cityscapes, like with how, quote, sea level, uh, seawater is raising salt levels in coastal woodlands along the entire Atlantic coast plain from Maine to Florida. Huge swaths of contingent forests are dying. They're now known in the scientific community as ghost forests. Unfortunately, it's also true that climate changes and other environmental changes continue to exceed scientific predictions of what will happen in the near future, not to mention the further one. During the summer 2021 heat dome event in the North American West Coast, when coastal temperatures tragically rose past 100 degrees Fahrenheit or for Celsius into the 40s, and to a record of 121.28 Fahrenheit or 49.6 degrees Celsius in Lytton, British Columbia, Canada, it is estimated that over a billion marine animals perished along Canada's Pacific coast alone by the beginning of July. Towards the end of July 2021, more than 250 wildfires burned across British Columbia, decimating forests, grasslands, and animal habitats, while of course also contributing to the disruption of the normal human activities through the destruction of communities, closure of highways and regional areas, and the alteration of air quality, among other problems. Though these conditions have shocked climate specialists to imagine something like that in the middle uh, or the later part of the century, uh, and have prompted Washington state governor to demarcate the beginning of a permanent emergency. It is also true that writers of science fiction and speculative fiction have already been imagining these changes seen through climate crisis and other uh, imminent uh, environmental shifts that will affect our sense of place, ways of living and quality of life. Of course, by uh, imminent in following the thinking of Frank Kermode, Brian Masumi, and Joshua Gunn and David E. Beard. I mean, something ongoing uh, where we are already in the midst rather than imminent with the I, which refers to something coming soon, something anticipated in the near future. As Masumi contends, at first, our culture embodies the perpetual imminence of the accident, and then he corrects himself better the imminence of the accident. And considering the future as imagined through science fiction and speculative fiction, or what I will henceforth refer to with the umbrella term SF writing, we are prompted with several questions. What does human society and culture relate to 
climate effects. Uh, sorry, how does human society and culture relate to climate effects and other environmental changes as myriad stressors become exacerbated in near future settings? How do human concerns extrapolated forward from, a t from today entangle with non-human entities and communities? What does loss gain or alter for humanity and where we inhabit the world as we adapt or fail to adapt to elements like climate change, resource scarcity, ecological unknowns, pandemics, and or evolution, et cetera. SF writing about the future by diverse contemporary writers considers how and where humanity will choose to live tomorrow and beyond, presenting a variety of potential living situations for our descendants and perhaps even our near future selves. Mapping these issues through the lens of fiction, today I'll consider constructs like the city, as well as other imagined future living scenarios for human populations. Some of these imaginings about the future are disturbing and even dystopian, but also encompass a variety of futurisms, terms suggesting the imperative and opportunity of forward, generative, and healing cultural movements as conceived by writers speculating about more positive outcomes, despite what are currently troubling local, regional, and global issues. As Bold observes, SF writing is, quote, replete with references to climate change. Some well-known examples include Octavia E. Butler's 1993 Parable of the Sower and the sequel, uh, 1988 Parable of the Talents, the first which stages a near future California in which water scarcity means it costs several times as much as gasoline. Socioeconomic disparity is a widening gap. Arid conditions easily enable brush fires and coast uh, redwood trees are dying, while houses built on the edge of the Pacific collapse into the ocean, among other issues. This is a narrative in which both walled neighborhoods and urban greater Los Angeles and more rural communities become unsafe, prompting the continued vast brick dispersal of the community's eco-religious group called Earthseed before it follows its originator's vision to seed the stars in what Jerry Canavan calls an extrasolar journey. A further series that references climate change consists of Margaret Atwood's Mad Adam books, Orcs and Creek from 2003, Fear of the Flood from 2009, and Mad Adam from 2013. This narrative features obvious, obvious geographical changes from climate-related and other environmental issues, like along the Eastern Seaboard with Harvard underwater and New York relocated to become New New York, as well as the disappearance of autumn and any snowfall by the time of the first book. But the Mad Adam books, like the Parable ones, are not just about climate change, despite claims about an SF uh, writing genre called climate fictions. One landmark critique and critical discussion of this terminology can be found in Paradox's Climate Fictions issue, edited by Alison Sperling. Atwood herself argues that it's not climate change, it's everything change. This indicates a social, environmental, and even narrative aspect that exceeds the reductivism of bringing everything down to climate. Borrowing from this comment, though they tell themselves as climate fiction, the three everything change anthologies published by Arizona State University echo the fact that such narratives have dimensions beyond that of climate. These stories include living situations in the near future like an Ottawa beset by hurricane while a political uh, coup occurs, a Beijing with even worse air, uh, air pollution particulate while resources dwindle, or a society completely situated under the ocean while on the surface island cities are under sail, hodgepodge flotilla of boats and containers lashed together and supporting a dense honeycomb of buildings, plants, and machinery. Perhaps Atwood's observation about everything change is also one that recognizes the futurisms beyond the climate parameters. Of course, the fact that not everything is about climate translates even into narratives that feel very much about how climate change has affected human society. This is true of something like Paolo Bacigalupi's 2015, The Water Knife, where the ongoing mega drought in the American Southwest is exacerbated into the near future and several cities, corporate players, refugees, local militias, and citizens of places like Phoenix, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, buy for control of the water rights connected to the diminishing Colorado River system. The near future, this near future, is all about the social interactions that have literally become cutthroat, not merely uh, the climate elements. This world, as Zizek would say, consists of, quote, a disarming frankness where one admits everything 
that this fully acknowledged, full acknowledgement of our power interests does not in any way present, prevent us from pursuing those interests. Since our society seems to have transitioned to a mode best encapsulated by the adage, they know very well what they're doing, yet they're doing it. It is possible though, that a genre and cultural uh, aspect considering climate futurisms might be currently under development in contemporary SF writing. Two prime examples are Kim Stanley Robinson's 2017 New York 2140 and 2020 Ministry for the Future. The first, for instance, deals with trying to find positive outcomes in an urban environment that has been devastated by environmental conditions and might very well be devastated again. That is, New York 2140 is a snapshot of the imagined future history of the city that ultimately stands in an intertemporal interval between major calamities. In one of the first reviews of Robinson's novel, Jerry Canavan highlights what the ambiguously named citizen character calls not the Anthropocene, but the Anthropocide. This character also refers to the hydrocatastrophe and the geo-revolution. These last are certainly useful in categorizing the calamity imposed by the melting of large portion of the global ice reserves and the resultant sea level rise. Robinson captures this disastrous element through a pair of meltwater-related pulses, or floods that uh, inundate New York Harbor and every other coastal city around the world, mainly in two big surges that shove the ocean up 50 feet, as glacial intricacies and the polar ice systems fail. Even the hard coastal protection structures like dikes or sea wall walls fail, perhaps giving more credence to the natural water breaks seen with coastal wetlands. This scenario in New York 2140, by the way, is not as speculative as we might like to believe, given the current day concerns about, for instance, the so-called Antarctic doomsday glaciers, aka the Thwaites and Pine Island glaciers. But in interviews, Robinson has framed New York 2140 as a comedy of coping, and is deliberately choosing, in part, to look past what could very well be, um, excuse me, could very well be a violent and catastrophic transition. In fact, Robinson refers to himself as a utopian science fiction writer and eschews the dystopian label completely. Interviews that reflect on New York 2140 and the more recent Ministry for the Future, Robinson insists that his central concern is how the globe can respond to such a disaster and begin to halt the momentum of global warming. In New York 2140, at least, we get a sense of what Robinson imagines might happen with economics, political will, and the lives of the citizens alongside those of the greater ecological community. These constructs and others are all caught between the event markers of forces that affect the city and its people. With this in mind, we might call narratives like these more recent ones, climate futurisms, since they not only imagine the dire outcomes of something like climate change, but also evolve the more generative intention to ameliorate our position vis-a-vis -vis the future. However, we might also refer to those and other texts that directly consider urban living spaces with my titular city futurisms. While elsewhere, I argue that contemporary SF narratives imagining the future environmental changes to the places that we recognize today in the real world might be classified as eco-critical dystopias. And I still think this could be a valuable movement away from what Tom Boylan and others classified as the critical dystopia and reflecting upon and responding to the hard times of the 1980s and 1990s, I recognize the, some value in Robinson's arguments that we must feel inspired to respond to disaster and begin to halt momentum of our various crises, whether they are to do with the climate or other environmental changes. Ecocritical dystopianism involves a surge of utopian desire, especially as part of the experiential affect of engaging with its narratives, or even directly with how the characters respond in the end to their predicaments, but city futurism suggests a more specific engagement with how we imagine the urban. In part, this might encompass thinking through Robinson's idea that, quote, getting through the 21st century without a mass extinction event means making ourselves uh, far more scarce, at least over the large parts of the planet. Here, Robinson is in part drawing upon E.O. Wilson with his half-Earth plan. But in thinking through various city futurisms, which should actually look beyond the urban and beyond merely technological solutions or anthropocentrism, other concerns arise than the notion of simply abandoning nature to recover itself while we supposedly isolate ourselves in techno-utopian enclaves. 
With this in mind, we need to take a step back to revisit the roots of various futurisms, both existing and emerging. Here I'm referring to Alondra Nelson's 1988 suggestion of a community and writing approach called Afrofuturism. As Nelson puts it in her 2002 introduction to a social tech special issue considering the term, quote, Afrofuturism can broadly be defined as African-American voices with other stories to tell about culture, technology, and things to come. She elaborates that this involves sci-fi imagery, futurist themes, and technological innovation in the African diaspora. I would hesitate to fully label uh, Octavia Butler's parable narratives as Afrofuturism texts, since they most certainly contain strong dystopian emergences, they're especially vital in demonstrating an imagined future in which the social problems arising from environmental stressors are so entangled that escape is more desirable than continued attempts at substance at fraught locales, whether these are city-based or rural, even if escape is ultimately impossible since ecological and social problems have not only become so intertwined, but they are nearly ubiquitous. More recently, Afrofuturism has inspired a couple of highly relevant terms. One is Grace Dillon's terminology of indigenous futurisms, which she coined back in 2003 after Alondra Nelson uh, his wonderful intro and editing of a special issue on Afrofuturism, a fact she credits in her Walking the Clouds. In a special issue of Canadian Review of Comparative Literature on Environmental Ethics and Activism in Indigenous Literature and Film, Warren Carrieu and Isabel St. Amand articulate a drive to, quote, create, envision, and dream Indigenous futures, quote, unquote, that they remind us in many ways, grim, disturbing, and seemingly hopeless realities have inspired indigenous narrative artists to investigate, make sense of, and create hope out of disruption and destruction, end quote. Some prominent recent examples, despite what are also clearly dystopian themes, include Harold Johnson's Corvus, Sherry Dimeline's The Marrow Thieves, and Louise Erdrich's Future Home of the Living God. The latter, for instance, involves return to indigenous sovereignty over their treaty lands, but with notable adaptations, the original treaty grounds of a traditional Ojibwe land are reclaimed, but in organizing the reclamation of land, their efforts are more geared to what the community can accomplish, since they, quote, want to make the reservation one huge, intensely worked, highly productive farm. This is far cry from what is happening in the actual cities where, somewhat a la Margaret, or Margaret Atwood's 1985 The Handmaid's Tale, an authoritarian theocracy has risen while some human progeny devolves. A second response to an adaptation of Afrofuturism is Nnedi Okorafor's argument for African futurism, which is, quote, specifically and more directly rooted in African culture, history, mythology, and point of view, as it then branches into the Black diaspora and does not privilege or center the West. African futurism is concerned with visions of the future and is interested in technology, leaves the earth, skews optimistic, and is centered on and predominantly written by people of African descent, Black people, as rooted, uh, as rooted first and foremost in Africa. End quote. Uh, a primary and relevant example of this is Okorafor's own mother of invention story, situated in a future Nigerian city named New Delta, which, is, which used to be swamplands and riverways, and uh, the greatest export was oil. In the narrative, the landscape boasts, quote, low skyscrapers, buildings and homes that are carpeted with a world famous stunning green grass and roads fringed with it. This grass having been engineered as a panaceic air scrubbing super plant that also replaces rice just after its extinction as a food source. Of course, despite obvious futurism aspects here, the story also questions biogenetic, technological creation, since the main character is highly allergic to the GMO plant and pollen, pollen storms are also a threat. Beyond Afro, African, and indigenous futurisms, we might consider other futurism leading types of narratives that intersect with cities and other ways that SF writers imagine we will live in the future. Solar futurism certainly applies to two examples seen with the editors Joey Erschrick and uh, Clark A. Miller's 2019 The Weight of Light and 2021 Cities of Light anthologies. A related term, solar punk, builds on uh, previous cyberpunk, which was coined by author William Gibson in relation to his 1984 novel Neuromancer, 
a narrative where especially digital technologies sculpt the social landscape and cultural norms from individual humans to artificial intelligences in a dystopian future. The term solar punk, however, seeks to reframe the punky indicated so as to propose better futures. These solar punk narratives are generally billed as suggestions that humanity succeeds in some ways rather than failing. With a focus on the climate crisis and other environmental hurdles, humanity moves to a more of a reliance on renewable energies such as wind and solar power. These should be taken with a grain of salt though. Uh, you might critique how proponents of the term only focus on positivity as a facet of the genre, genre since uh, the dystopian certainly makes an appearance. For instance, La, instance, Larissa Lies 2018, The Tiger Flu has solar punk elements but also biopunk ones, which like solar punk is a play on the term cyberpunk, yet with a focus on biotechnologies. Essentially, climate change, technological fallout, ongoing pandemic, and neo-feudal strife, among other things, rear up in the tiger flu. And the outcome in the novel, as in some other stories labeled as solar punk, does not seem to be as utopian for humanity. A further consideration might be something we could call multi-species futurism. In building on terms like Afrofuturism, African futurism, and Indigenous futurism, as well as other alternative futurisms, or what Bonnie Chattopadhyay astutely and hopefully calls co-futurisms, we might consider texts like those in the 2021 anthology Multi-Species Cities, uh, Solar Punk Urban Futures. This anthology, we should note, links itself to solar punk, but we might critically assess if there is uh, more to consider than just a human that seems to be the center, at the center of solar punk narratives. How can we move away from the anthropocentrism of the Anthropocene that is, and entangle human interactions with the other life forms that comprise our complex local, regional, and global ecological systems? The planet is much greater than the human, of course, though we seem to have infiltrated every corner of it with our detritus, as David Ferriero argues, argues in his 2019 Anthropocene Poetics, Deep Time, Sacrifice Zones, and Extinction. With this in mind, as well as several complicating factors, including the potential advent of deep sea mining operations, the enormous scale of plastic and other pollution, such as the Great, Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and phenomena like uh, anthropogenic sea level rise, we are in need of an ocean futurism. This potential term echoes the blue futurism in a link to the so-called blue humanities and is focused on uh, one of the least explored and least understood portions of the planet, the global oceans and their ecological systems. A textual example uh, comes in the form of the 2019 Current Futures, a sci-fi anth ocean anthology. Rather importantly, though some stories in such categories might wish to present a utopian flavor, solar punk-esque movement of humans towards symbiosis with the oceans it is critically relevant to also remember the problematic areas I just mentioned. In a return to city futurisms, it is important to note that no single SF writing text or even real world situation can really be encompassed by one terminological cap. Many SF texts, especially those written in recent years, encompass both dystopian and utopian themes and scenarios. This is a spectrum, not an ultimate state, and dependent upon those observing and experiencing. Ashley Dawson, in her 2017 Extreme Cities, The Peril and Promise of Urban Life in the Age of Climate Change, argues that human survival and the survival of many of our fellow creatures on Earth and the <clears throat> demands that we imagine new forms of collective flourishing. The ideal of a good city in the time of um, climate crisis offers a paradigm with the kinds of human connection upon which we collectively our collective survival de depends, end quote. Here I want to highlight, for instance, the events in June and July of 2120 in the Cascadian region. These demonstrate though we tend to only consider ourselves and even try to separate ourselves from the rest of the natural world, as per Robinson's future city suggestion, it is equally important to consider how plants and animals are being affect by, affected by ecological changes and speculate how they might be affected going forward. We already have in this time many connections with species that have adapted to our living places, what science writer David Quammen would call weedy species. For a true city futurism that is forward thinking, generative and healing as we build towards more positive futures, we need to incorporate those other perspectives insisted upon by things like indigenous futurisms, multi-species futurisms and co-futurisms. 
We need to imagine how even human intersections with ecological and biodiversity alterations will in turn affect society, culture, and the future of our species. Ultimately, we need to remember that we are a part of and never separate from the natural world. Only in thinking and living in this manner will we truly conceive of sustainable cities of the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Conrad. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'll just open up questions. If you would like to ask, you can probably just shout out. Uh, well, I have a question. Okay, great. <laughs> no one else is going to jump in uh, right away. Um, so, yeah, uh, you've been studying these ideas uh, for a while now. How has the literature changed as um, climate has become more and more of uh, something that's very solid and tangible uh, in our culture? I think that some writers uh, like Kim Stanley Robinson, for instance, are instead of uh, pushing towards you know, the dystopian, which has been something that's been written you know, quite often for quite a while, uh, is trying to push for more hopeful imaginings forward. Uh, the same with solar punk and those kinds of styles of writing. Uh, imagining what's possible and how we can adapt and change has been one of these themes that we've seen in recent years, uh, rather than just the dire outcomes of uh, certain dystopias. Yeah, so does that kind of connect to, there's been kind of more of a movement towards like positive psychology in talking about climate issues because people are just getting really tired of it. Like how much of it is, of the fictions we write, is it about, um, you know, how do I reach these people? You know, like we were trying to write dystopias to have this effect. Did it have the desired effect? And, or, and it is the way that we write changing because there's more urgency and we need to like try different ways to affect change. I think certainly in recent years with uh, psychological studies, uh, they've been noticing climate anxiety and, uh, uh, solastalgia, which is a term that uh, references nostalgia for the previous times before mm -hmm. climate change. So certainly I think there's that psychological aspect uh, and that probably does connect. Uh, I haven't seen a study that says that the fiction connects with uh, those things, but it probably does connect with how, you know, the readers are responding to, uh, you know, what they've seen before. People are, uh, you know, fairly tired of these dystopian elements, even though those things are still part of these new texts. Yeah, it kind of feels to some extent that, you know, we are now living within the dystopia. So, you know, when is it a dystopia and when is it, you know, just uh, real contemporary fiction, I suppose. Right. The, the new normal seems very uh, dystopian, yeah. especially uh, I, I live in the part of the world that experienced the heat wave, the heat dome uh, in the summer of 2021. And it was pretty unbearable. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like there's a question in the uh, chat box there. I can answer it directly. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, just Sona, thank you for asking your question. Um, more greenery in cities would definitely help. I think that's a trend in lots of places in the world, actually. Uh, we've seen that, I believe, in Paris. They're starting to have more green roofs, up, for instance, so they're reconstituting uh, how a particular cities are laid out so that it's not to do with uh, cars or fossil fuel using, um, you know, transport, uh, so that there's more walking and biking and those kinds of things with those, um, well, city layouts. Of course, some cities, uh, are, um, you know, not doing those things. I, I live in, in Edmonton, Alberta, which is, uh, a petrocultural capital, basically, where we're still using lots of fossil fuels. So, uh, but I'd say that, you know, Brussels, I think, was uh, working on uh, adding more greenery to their uh, cityscape, that kind of thing. So definitely, uh, from, from my perspective, that would make sense. And then also, we might consider how we interact with those, uh, you know, biological life forms that would be added to the cities. How does that change how we live? And how does that change how we, uh, you know, consider uh, living in the world? Oh, 
All right. Um, yeah, Conrad, uh, we got another question here from Allison. Um, I'll just read it out just in case, you know, when we have this posted, if the uh, questions aren't uh, aren't in the uh, posted part. Um, what book recommendations do you have for students interested in exploring these genres? Favorites for different audiences, young, old, contrarians, etc. Also, are there more positive utopian visions that are as engrossing as the dystopias? Ooh, multi-part. Yeah, okay, I'll answer the last part uh, first. Again, uh, I think that, you know, if you want something that feels more utopian, uh, even though there is the dystopia that's involved, uh, I would connect with Ken Stanley Robinson's last, uh, most latest books, um, you know, New York 2140 and uh, Ministry for the uh, Future. Those are, uh, you know, attempting to create more of a utopian vision despite the things that have gone wrong. Um, and, you know, trying to push for that ad adaptation, uh, human adaptation. Um, and then, you know, book recommendations, there's, there are so many out there. Uh, that uh, I've engaged with, that I enjoy, um, and you know, I think are important. Uh, I'd certainly suggest starting to look into indigenous futurism texts. Those are uh, quite relevant right now and consider different uh, ways of living often than just you know, cityscapes or urban aspects. Um, of course, there are several uh, texts out there that do involve destruction or uh, uh, you know, changes to city places. Um, for instance, I mentioned the water knife by Pile Black Shaloupi, uh, where uh, Phoenix itself becomes unlivable. And uh, you know, there's climate refugees, there's water shortages and uh, price hiking and that kind of thing. Um, so th there's so many different texts uh, that I could suggest. Um, those are just a, a few of them. And I, I mentioned a few others in my talk too, so. You're welcome. Uh, another question here, uh, the Sand County Almanac was written in the 40s and the author has a lot of present aspects that makes the readers think about, oh yes, the Sand County Almanac, yes. That's just a recommendation from Jasona. Uh, yes, I totally agree. I make my students read the Sand County Almanac, even though it is older, yeah. Thank you, Jasona. I actually haven't read it myself, so I'll have to pick it up after this. Oh, it's very good. All right, any other questions? I feel like I have a lot of questions. <laughs> you can, I'm happy to answer more if you want. Um, okay, I, I saw this idea um, and I'm, I'm not gonna be able to articulate it very well, but it was something along the lines of when we're writing about um, dystopias for, you know, white contemporary people, it's essentially they're going through what indigenous peoples went through, through like colonization, that kind of like displacement. Um, does that question make sense? And do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. That kind um, of like parallel for like, yeah. what is a dystopia? Did, you know, Indigenous peoples talking about, you know, what happened to them? Are they living in a dystopia, I guess? Right. Uh, I'd have to think more about that specific suggestion, you know, about uh, white people vis-a-vis -vis Indigenous people, but uh, I do know, I did talk to, uh, I mentioned the author, William Gibson, the uh, one that wrote uh, Neuromancer, uh, once at a book signing that he had, and I asked him, uh, you, know, you know, why or, or how did he come up with the ways that these places that these people are living in that are very dystopian, you know, how did he come up with these places? And he said that he looked at how people were living in, you know, third world countries, so-called, or, or places that with, you know, not as much economic prosperity, uh, and he modeled them after those. So I don't, that doesn't quite answer your question, but it's a, a supposedly an echo of uh, places that are not uh, as well off or don't have as many, um, you know, resources perhaps according to Gibson at least. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about how that compares to um, Margaret Atwood talking about The Handmaid's Tale and saying that everything in there, um, nothing is actually fictional. Is that is that actually true? I don't, I'm not even sure. I don't know if that's actually true. I mean, it is set in the future, so that's, uh, you know, 
questionable. But. Right, but that, you know, she based a lot of the story around things that had actually happened to right. women in other cultures and at other times. Um, and so it's kind of, I don't know, a historical rehashing and kind right. of into the future. That does seem, that seems like it would be uh, a reasonable uh, guess. So that way makes a lot of claims. So <laughs> we can't, we can't always take it right or our word, right? Okay. <laughs> we should remain critical of the text. That's what I'll say. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Conrad, for coming to talk to us. I feel like I have a lot of uh, terms and ideas written down here to, to think about and, and, and books as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me part of the Sustainability Center and uh, the College of Charleston.